on today's World Inside. China, on course to beef up cyber and data security with a slew of new measures. Are they enough? With the requirement of the you know, uh, different countries of the data localization, you have to set up a, a lot of the data centers in different uh, places. And global pop art icon Andy Warhol in an unusual exhibition in China. His stories and legends from Warhol curators. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology said on Monday it has issued a draft three-year action plan to develop the country's cybersecurity industry, estimating the sector may be worth more than 250 billion yuan by the year 2023. Last week, China firmed up regulations on data security, proposed the draft rules calling for all data-rich tech companies with over 1 million users to undergo security reviews before listing overseas. So how will these measures do the job of protecting data in China? Are they enough? What does it mean when different countries having their own rules and regulations on these? Let's loop in our panelists. For data security in Beijing, I'm joined by Lu Chuanying, Research Fellow at the Shanghai Institute of International Studies. In Boston, I'm joined by Robert Siciliano, Partner and Head Trainer at ProtectNowLLC.com. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. I want to start by asking you, what is the real essence, gentlemen? Do you see the debates going on regarding data security, particularly beyond the borders? Mr. Lu. So recently, we know that the Chinese government published a cybersecurity review regulations, which is try to target on this, this uh, social media platform and the internet platform who start and they collect a lot of the personal information. And uh, it is, seems to be our, a risk posed by them to have so many data. And, uh, and on the other hand, some of the companies are go abroad, for example, uh, go to the United States to list it there at the stock market, which some people believe that it will pose the, uh, the national security risk because they have so many data on their hand. Mm. So how, Mr. Siciliano, it is the debate evolve in your country, you know, between the government and the business? American corporations, um, uh, Always, are always on the edge in regards to what the law will and will not allow. Mm. Uh, it is a constant battle between American corporations and the American government. And the companies themselves hire lobbyists to continually push that envelope, mm. to uh, extend that line in such a way where uh, they often have politicians on the inside that are working for them in such a way that sways uh, legislation, laws, uh, towards the corporations themselves. Coupled with the fact that most um, government agencies and politicians don't understand data security or data privacy enough to even uh, protect the consumers in which voted for them. Mm -hmm. A very interesting situation. Mr. Liu, uh, regarding the latest regulation, it seems that it's about Chinese companies seeking overseas IPOs. Uh, the Chinese side believe that the U.S. side, for example, has been doubling down on the Chinese uh, uh, tech firms listed overseas with uh, inspections and also with auditing and uh, double checks. Uh, and this would uh, involve uh, uh, data security regarding China's national interest. Mr. Liu, here comes the question. Uh, what would that mean for Chinese companies seeking overseas IPOs? Will tech firms still have much space to explore 
in that regard under the current circumstances? Actually, those actions of the tech companies mm -hmm. post the risk and challenge to the government because you no, know, the government want to uh, protect the data security, but these situations make them uh, uh, into a situation that because you know, at one hand, the tech company will be uh, under the laws of Chinese government. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they uh, uh, listed abroad, uh, United States in particular, it will have to under the jurisdiction of the United States, right. so, but we have the two different uh, legal system. We have different laws, and uh, on the other hand, we have we do not have a multi multinational uh, arrangement to mm. solve the different of the uh, no, laws of the two jurisdictions. So that's the, the reason why we see uh, what happened recent days. Mm. Mr. Siciliano, what that mean for the industry? You know, the industry of. Uh, uh, in which high-tech companies used to be the pioneers, but it seems that there are more um, more uh, criticism, cynicism uh, against them. So all that scrutiny comes from the, the, the fact that we are now at a time when we only have, you know, a dozen or so corporations worldwide that have become monopolies mm -hmm. in, in such a way where they have way too much power uh, they have way too much power here domestically, and they have way too much power abroad. And it's it's only now that American companies are getting are, are facing the, the the pushback mm. that they have been receiving overseas for quite some time. Uh, and only now are American government uh, officials beginning to make an attempt mm. to break up those monopolies, but they're still a long ways away from that. Mm. Where, where again overseas, um, they mostly have prevented those monopolies from taking hold. Mm. Big tech companies around the world used to have ways of store their data in their own com in their own country, but also in the countries uh, where they operate and have regulations regarding the data security. Uh, but now. Uh, as we see this global changes, what would that mean for the big data? And will industries still be able to function on their earlier business model? I'm not sure how much the business model will change. Mm. I think internally it might create um, a lot more, I guess, work uh, internally for these organizations mm. where uh, regulation and compliance officers are going to be um, in quite demand mm -hmm. due to the fact that they're going to have uh, regulatory and compliance issues in a number of different countries opposed to just you know one or two uh, and the the technologists themselves CTOs and others uh, are going to have to separate and segregate a lot of that data mm -hmm. and that would also mean a, a, a lot of a diff the infrastructure will have to expand right. quite a bit mm -hmm. and that is going to also increase um the attack surface as well for bad guys or for mm -hmm. you know for criminal hackers that will ultimately affect profit margins too mm -hmm. uh so in a, in some way it will affect the business model but if they want to gain a foothold in these countries, mm -hmm. they're going to have to be flexible. What I see from this uh, issues is just the, the cost and efficiency. In the past, you just need to have one global data center. But recently, with the requirement of the you know, uh, different countries of the data localization, you have to set up a, a lot of the data centers in different places, So, which means you raise your cost. But it's, it's not uh, uh, every country have the power to negotiate with the, those the big tech companies to mm -hmm. ask them to do that. It's only the United States, China, Russia, European Union, this big state, mm -hmm. they have a numerous of the u internet users and big market who can uh, leverage this to the tech company, ask them to do that. Sir Lu, that's actually a, a fantastic question I was about to ask. Uh, to both of you, uh, we have seen so far continuous failure internationally uh, putting a commonly agreed upon framework on data security worldwide. After all, Mr. Siciliano, 
uh, I was preached, I was told uh, as a liberal art major uh, decades ago that internet is bringing all of us together uh, as a tool, as an infrastructure. Are we going to see a going back or stepping back from that concept and reality? Uh, are we already seeing a few first steps in that regard? You know, keeping in mind that the internet as we know it, uh, utilized for uh, commerce or even global commerce at this, at this time, is really only about 25 years old. Yeah. And it being global um, is even younger. And so that process and standards worldwide uh, in uh, developing countries is all brand new to them. Uh, it is going to take time, cooperation, uh, and um, more uh, regulation mm -hmm. in order for uh, us to see standards in such a way where uh, Europeans and Americans, Russians, Chinese, all essentially see eye to eye as to how that data is used and mm. shared and protected. So I want to say that uh, to answer your question, there are three uh, stakeholders in this, in this field. Mm -hmm. One is the government. They're fighting with each other and they want to you know, pursue their supremacy, hegemony. But we also have other stakeholders like the uh, company and business. Business want to have a unified market it, uh, for their, you know, to reduce the cost. And uh, also another factor I think is the technology. Mm -hmm. So the technology, if you look at the uh, history that the technology want to have our unified standard. If you look at the, the 3G, 4G, 5G, then we only have one standard. So this is the, the, the destination of the technology. Mm -hmm. It's not go to the diversified. It actually want to go to our unified. So the, the, what the, about the future? Um, it's, it's too early to, to make the judgment whether the uh, internet will still maintain uh, as the current one or it go to the you know, organization or mm. uh, split it into different models. Mm. So it depends on how these the three actors are interaction with each other. Mm. Lu Chuanying, Robert Siciliano, thank you so much, both of you, for bringing insights to all of us from your own perspective on such an important question. And this is World Insight. Coming up, global pop art icon Andy Warhol in an unusual exhibition in China. His stories and legends behind curating Warhol coming to you next. It's World Insight. And I'm Tian Wei. Andy Warhol, the pop art legend, turned a can of soup into a creative icon. He was the exemplary American artist of the 20th century, a symbol of what many think of modern art today. In an unusual exhibition in Beijing named Becoming Andy Warhol, curators present over 400 works covering the artist's whole career, hoping to paint a new and retrospective picture of Andy Warhol for audiences in China and also America of his time. Particularly, his story with the country China is being featured in some unique photos. In 1982, Andy Warhol visited China. He took his camera to sites including the Great Wall, the Tiananmen Square, leaving some candid yet dynamic shoots that are also historic as they capture the country's transition through reform and opening up. I had a tour with Philip Tenare, the director of UCCA Center for Contemporary Art, where the exhibition is. These are the most well-known works. Yes, this is a total breakthrough for Warhol when he started doing these in the early 1960s. I think a lot of people were quite confused because he was coming from this background where he was already a commercial illustrator, and then he decided to paint this everyday object, right, the, the soup can. Yeah. Um, but I think he was always interested in, you know, the, the potential of the everyday commodity, right, how it made people's lives a little happier, what it might represent, and also I think most importantly, how it's this totally standard experience that people have across all different classes and races and ages, right? I mean, anyone, you've spent time in America, anyone who's lived in America, 
has oh, probably this. had Campbell's soup, even though we don't think it's very good. But um, especially in the in the I was 1960s. trying to read the flavors, by the way. They're, 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 yeah, it's very 60s. Hot dog bean. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. And there's these funny jokes like the manhandlers. Like, what is Scott's broth? I don't know. What does it even mean, right? But it, it's just. Yeah. yeah. It's just so 1960. Totally. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the idea that you could make art out of something that's so everyday was yeah. something that was really important to a lot of artists at that time. A few years ago in UCCA, we did a show of Rauschenberg, you know, mm -hmm. and he made paintings just using cardboard put up on the wall. Um, this idea comes really from the artists of the early 20th century, people like Duchamp. You know, had this idea that anything can be art, but right. Warhol took that and ran with it to a new place, and he made it iconic. And people didn't realize this is art until it is, right? I mean, he was not recognized with his style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he was, because he was very successful as a commercial illustrator. This mm -hmm. is a time in the history of advertising before photography was yeah. everything. So if you were launching a new product, you hired a painter to draw, you know, your shoe or whatever it was. And he, he figured out when he first arrived in New York in the late 40s, early 50s, how to make a lot of money doing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was making like, you know, equivalent of millions of dollars today just as a, as a commercial artist. But he said at a certain point, that's not what I want to do. Mm. I want to be a real artist. You know, when people look at this, what would they think about the 1960s America? America at a different time, right? When a lot of people who are alive still had a memory of the Great Depression, the Second World War, you know, of times that were more difficult when there was scarcity. And so I think for some people, this kind of packaged uh, food, this packaged soup, you open it up and it's delicious. Of course, this is the photo. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is uh, I mean, people are pretty excited about this photo. Um, it's a great, Square. Yeah, it's a great story. He, um, he came in 1982, in yeah. October. Uh, so towards the end of his life, right, he's, he's highly established. Um, and he's invited by a, a young entrepreneur in Hong Kong and he's got, you know, he's got some British friends and he's got the guy, the other guy in the photo is called Christopher Makos. Right. Who, he was like Warhol's official photographer at that time, went everywhere with him. You had these photographers based on the square with his big, his, you can see the movie actually, it's this big blue camera mm. and they take the photo and they print it out and they color it by hand. So anyway, <laughs> it was quite a funny process. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And look at his face, also quite funny. And I think it's interesting because actually, like when he was a child in Pittsburgh, actually this kind of photograph would be very common. Mm -hmm. But by the 80s in America, yeah. it was antique, but China is still using it then, you know. So it sort of really shows you the, the difference. And um, but I think he's also super excited to be in China because no one knew who he was. No. So he could walk around the streets full of people right. and people just thought, oh, it's some, you know, some foreign guy. Uh, and, and it's actually a great scene in the little movie of his trip to China. Finally, he's in the Forbidden City in the back uh, garden you know, on the north side. Yes. And they run into some American tourists from Ohio or something and they recognize him <laughs> and take a picture <laughs> together. But he really enjoyed this uh, anonymity. Yeah. This is actually uh, this work he made just a, a few months before he died yeah. in 1987. And I think what's interesting is you see, you know, this crazy wig. Actually, he wore a wig his whole life. He lost his hair very young. Mm -hmm. So most pictures you see, it's, a, it's one wig or another. But by the end of his life, he's wearing what they call the fright wig, this crazy wig. Um, and it's almost like he's become a caricature of himself mm -hmm. or like a, he's in costume all the time, right? And I think that connects to something really important about Warhol, which is that in a way, his greatest work of art was himself. And, and, and I think this inspires a lot of artists. Um, I mean, of course, everyone knows pop and, and some of the, the strategies of how to treat images and repetition and mass production. But actually, I think if you want to talk about his influence on modern and contemporary art, mm -hmm. it's this idea that anything that the artist does can be art. Right. So his art is his paintings, it's his sculptures, but it's also his photos, it's also his films, it's also you know, in the late years he made TV shows, he produced record albums. So how did that also have an impact on artists themselves? I mean, for a time, you know, art is supposed to be art, and yeah. to be away from commercialization as much as possible, but from him, it's like, we are one, yeah. and maybe yeah. the more the better. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a um, complicated legacy, right? Because this, I think once you introduce that idea, all kinds of different people pick up and run with it in good ways and bad. Um, we even look at, you know, some popular artists today, like, I don't know if you know, Cause, who makes these kind of, they look like toys, um, is, is a child of Warhol. I mean, everyone's a child of Warhol in some way or another. Um, but I think this, 
this kind of relationship between art and commerce is by the time of his life, you know, from the 60s to the 80s, it becomes inescapable. Right. Is it easy to bring him over here? We had great partners. Um, the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, which is the town he comes from, right. um, has the biggest collection of his work. And throughout this whole process, even with COVID and you know, the curators and the, the couriers and all these professionals couldn't come, actually. The artist couldn't come because the artist is you know, not alive. Right. But the museum people, unfortunately, couldn't come either. Um, but it's interesting. The museum field is changing after COVID. You know, we now, um, and because we're more conscious of the environment, too. And normally, for a show like this, you would have, I don't know, 10 or 20 people coming to install. But this time, we did it all ourselves. Some key pieces, like this one, we had them on Zoom, you know, looking and watching to make sure it was handled properly. But it's. Um, Force us to grow in a really interesting The life of Andy Warhol is colorful, filled with creativity constantly drawn from daily life. He's screen printed images of soup cans, newspapers, and Coca Cola bottles have made a new way of expression pop art. What inspirations can we draw from the art icon in the times we live in? I joined Philip Tenari in a conversation with his counterpart of the exhibition, Patrick Moore, who's the director of the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, I'm joined by Patrick Moore, director of the Andy Warhol Museum, and in Beijing, Philip Tenari, director of UCCA Center for Contemporary Art. Gentlemen, welcome. Congratulations to this wonderful joint project. Tell me more about what kinds of ideas that you are trying to create in this exhibition about Andy Warhol and China. You know, so many people think about Andy Warhol and they think about Studio 54 and Marilyn Monroe and Campbell's soup cans. And those are iconic Warhol images and eras. But I'm here in Pittsburgh, which is a very industrial city in the United States, or at least it was when Andy Warhol was born here in the Great American Depression. So what we really want to portray is that Warhol was the son of immigrants to our country, that he came from a very uh, kind of dirty and energized and rich city, but that he had a life before he went to New York City and before he became the glamorous Andy Warhol. He was the son of an immigrant family, the Warholas, uh -huh. and they didn't have money, they didn't have anything. So he was on a long trajectory to become Andy Warhol. To you, Philippa, what is it about the exhibition? In this exhibition, a viewer can see you know, the illustrations he was doing in the 50s. Uh, one can see the work he did late in his life when he was completely established, and some people even thought it maybe past his prime. And you can also see things he did all along the way. You know, People don't realize a lot of the time that in addition to a painter, he was a very prominent experimental filmmaker um, people might not know that he was an obsessive photographer who took a camera with him almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all of these things are present in this exhibition. I remember very well, Phil, that you uh, show me to the photo of uh, Andy Warhol together with a photographer at the time working with him, standing in front of the uh, Gate of Heavenly Peace or Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square. And that has become an iconic moment also. Tell me more about uh, how your audience is responding to that it's made in this way that would have been popular when he was a child in Pittsburgh, right? It's, uh, it's hand colored. And there's actually film footage of, the, of that photo being taken by a photographer on Tenement Square, uh, this big blue camera. And you can just imagine Warhol, you know, been taking photos all his life, you know, towards the end of his life uh, with, his, with his friend, Christopher Makos, you know, in this place he'd never been, surrounded by people who actually don't even know who he is, being like an ordinary tourist and then encountering this camera that's like probably similar to one he might have seen when he was a child and getting this this really kind of kitschy print, right? With this, mm -hmm. the cheeks are red and the colors are bright yellow and uh, these different things. And I think it's, it's just so much fun because for like a normal Chinese audience with some memory of this period of the 80s, they, they, they probably have photos like that at home as well. Um, so it, it just creates all these different points of connection. And I think it, it gestures to this moment of him being in China, but you know, that's just one of the many, many things he did. So it's important that it's included. Think about the time when he traveled to Beijing, uh, China just reformed and opened up, uh, uh, everybody mm -hmm. in blue and uh, green uh, uh, suits. Uh, 
uh, actually, he was also saying, I don't mind wearing blue. Actually, I enjoyed it. And he did almost every day uh, the same wardrobe, uh -huh, even when sleeping in the Beijing hotel. So Patrick, how do all of these stories uh, resonate with your audience, uh, their understanding about China and also uh, China through an artist's eyes? We're very proud of Andy Warhol here in Pittsburgh. So the idea of presenting Warhol's work around the world, but particularly in China, is a great source of pride for all of us here because uh, we believe that Andy was the prototypical American artist, mm -hmm. that he was an artist who really typified what it is to be an American to be interested in fame and success, but also to have a deep history with his family. So I think for us, it's been this extraordinary thing to think of all of these new visitors in China yeah. getting to see it work. Right. Phil, uh, artists are influenced and impacted by geopolitics and everything around them as well. How do you see you know, a rediscovering, in a way, of Andy Warhol among your audience? I think that at this time of rebalancing and uh, rediscovery and reopening, it's, it's important to, to try and go a little bit deeper. Um, you know, there's been exchange between these these countries and these cultures for, you know, since we're 50 years past Kissinger's visit, right? And, and 40 years past this Warhol's visit, but um, but there's always more to discover and more to learn. And I, I think that's one thing that this, this show is able to do. This is mm. not a show that's being down to its audience. Uh, and it's not a show that's trying to, to, to put some things in front of people and have them come and, you know, worship them or, or, or pay their respect. It's really trying to provide a very open platform for people to to learn something about another time and place that is relevant to their time and their place because there's so much in how Warhol saw himself and how he saw the world that's that's relevant uh, you know to America today and to China today um, right. starting from you know his idea of of himself as as a medium right or as, as a media um, you know a constantly framing uh, transmitting positioning performing, um, I mean, this is, you know, this is something we see from the visitors in the show. I think if Andy Warhol were alive and he saw, you know, the kinds of pictures people make in front of his works, <laughs> I can't imagine he'd be anything but thrilled. Yeah. Let's move on about, you know, what art could mean to all of us. Uh, Andy Warhol being provocative, uh, linking art with consumerism, being critical about that, but at the same time also becoming a pioneering figure in that. How do you see this combo in a way, Patrick? I think that the reason that Warhol is so fascinating to people is that he lived through an era in the United States where America was a particularly exciting place to be, mm. where different people of different social classes were meeting and making creative work together in this place, New York City. So for me, Warhol has always been a kind of magic portal into this time that I certainly wish that I could have been a part of. I would have <laughs> loved to have been in New York yeah. City in the 1960s, the 1970s. I actually was there in the 1980s. But I think that Warhol and artists in general are able to document things and to bring through the spirit of a time. And that really was a great time in the United States. Mm. Chinese artists being impacted by Warhol because that's one of the earlier figures they got to know uh, from the American contemporary art. Uh, but also at the same time, they are looking for their own languages. How do you see this uh, absorbing and also trying to create uh, from the Chinese uh, uh, contemporary art scene? How do you look back at the, you know, being trying to be original, you know, of Warhol's time? You know, you can talk about Warhol's influence on global contemporary art, right. on, on China contemporary art in, in all kinds of ways. You know, there's some very obvious ones, like in the 90s in China, there was actually a movement right. uh, where you know, some artists, you know, as China's market reforms were deepening, actually took like imagery from, you know, political posters in China from the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. you know, his idea of of performing the self and actualizing the self. And, mm. and you know, many, many artists in the years since then have, have taken up that project. Mm. 
you know, after talking about Warhol, what about the project uh, uh, cooperation between the two of you? How did that idea come into being? And I just want to know, how did you make it happen during the time when the pandemic is still one of the biggest challenges? Patrick? What was particularly moving to me was the way that my staff at the Warhol worked with Phil's staff at the UCCA. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were very kind to one another. They really understood the challenges of doing an exhibition like this during the pandemic. And that really is a kind of example of what cultural exchange does. Two groups of people work together on a project to achieve something, and they come out of it with a really deep understanding of one another. Yeah, this kind of collaboration is, is you know, it's, 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 it's rare and it's precious and it's mm. extremely valuable. So I know you uh, and your staff have been doing uh, some of the groundbreaking exhibitions, for example, of Picasso's show uh, last year and this time Andy Warhol. But because of the pandemic, uh, the installation process will be a very much a challenging process because uh, Patrick and his team will not be able to make it into Beijing. So, but every piece is so precious. And as a curator, you want to present it to the best, in the best way to the audience and for the sake of Patrick and his team's uh, great work. So, so how is, is it done? You know, it's interesting because, of course, like we, the pandemic has taught us a lot of lessons and uh, some of them are connected to other things. Like, for example, we've become more conscious of our carbon footprints, right? Yeah. Um, so, and this is a global trend in museums, actually. Uh, I think a lot of museum leaders have decided that even if it's not so easy for people to travel, you know, it's still so important for artworks to travel. Um, and the artworks become almost like these emissaries uh, of, of another time and place, which they already are. But the fact that, you know, we don't get to, people don't get to come with them almost makes it even more, more powerful. Yeah. Um, and then you know, there's a lot of, filling of the gap by different digital technologies you know so all of the decisions about what goes where and how the show looks are basically made in a computer model you know before anyone's on site mm -hmm. you know, we, before we built the walls we basically knew exactly the configuration and things would, would hang on them and then you know as we're doing now there's a whole process of uh, zoom <laughs> from the from this from the site you know you sort of change your schedule 12 hours time difference so that people from Pittsburgh can can oversee, you know, the unpacking and the hanging of, of some particularly valuable works. But it only it only is possible when there's a very high level of trust and collaboration mm. between the people. Working. Patrick Moore, Philip Tenari, gentlemen, what a pleasure. The two curators, they made it happen. An unusual exhibition of Andy Warhol in China. For a man who said everyone would get 15 minutes of fame, Andy Warhol's legacy has lasted much longer. His works of art are still among the most sought after items in the world today. That legend will likely to continue after you are hearing my conversation recently with some young curators and collectors from China. Let's listen in. Hi, everyone. Good to see you guys. Thanks for Hi. 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 This exhibition is amazing. Which work of his uh, actually impress you the most? Yes, for me, I think it's his, um, f uh, the photography of him and Christopher Marcos in front of the Tiananmen Square that was taken during his trip uh, to China in t uh, 1982, I believe, because I watched the and, uh, Andy Warhol in China documentary that kind of, you know, well, uh, do documented the whole trip to China, where there's a very funny um, kind of little tidbits from the trip All that the he world. said when he was in the Beijing, he kept Warhol asking for McDonald's. And back then, McDonald's American wasn't even like existing. Culture. It was like three years after the Maryland reform Monroe. and opening and up. the Campbell soup can. Andy and Western culture so inspired one U.S. educated Chinese that he decided to share them with the Chinese people in an unusual way. Andy Warhol's trip to China was the dream of Alfred Siu and Christopher Marcos, Andy's personal photographer. You know, just think about one artist that's so much fo focusing on commercialization, right? Yeah. Into a country that has nothing to do almost with commercialization. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was totally, um, I guess, a new, new world for him and yeah. a new world for people who were um, interacting with him. 
And also for you guys, I mean, you were born, most of you, after 1982, right? JJ, what about for you? I love the ordinary Campbell soup. <laughs> it has lots of flavors and, you know, it makes people think about their food and their consumption. What about for you, Neil? Yeah, for me, I think that must be the Brio box because mm -hmm. since I study art history, so I think it's definitely amazing to be able to see the real, you know, the work of art. Is that having also an impact on Chinese contemporary artists? I'm sure they do. Totally, totally, because I think, you know, back in the 80s and 70s, you know, lots of Chinese contemporary artists, you know, even like Xu Bing, like Huang Rui, like those artists are looking at lots of Western uh, artists, their practice, mm -hmm. like, you know, Andy Warhol, like Rauschenberg, mm -hmm. and their attitudes towards art and also their relationship with, you know, um, the areas that's con normally considered as non-art. Right. I think it's greatly shaped, you know, Chinese contemporary. He influenced a very hot artist right now, who also draws elements from mass and pop culture. He's called uh, Wang Jianuo, he, Pikachu, yeah. um, Doraemon. So the younger generation of Chinese artists, like in their 20s and 30s, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. But you know, to me, it's also interesting how the youngest generation of Chinese artists today, how they are absorbing their life and how they are getting gathered materials, you know, getting inspirations. Where does it come from? I think an artist has influence from the time that they're born, the age. Yeah. Um, the technology obviously made information more accessible to everybody. So artists are exposed to a variety of things that they previously weren't, which has pros and cons. I think it's much harder right now to be in the solitary creative zone that previous artists used to be. Mm. So more and more artists are, I guess, going the Andy Warhol path of trying to uh, merge the secular world with art. I like that. It's beautifully put. Um, one of the things people look at the exhibition, and Andy Warhol, the person himself, is about the fact that how he has been able to jump out of his society, but still in the very middle of it, you know, the commercialization itself. So how do you see that commercialization, the 1960 America, China today? I agree with the notion that, like uh, Neil mentioned, that artists as a profession was basically, uh, were a superstar, was basically created by Warhol. And you see that actually every day now in China and all, of, all over the world, in the or art world nowadays, that artists are somehow equal to celebrities, especially when they have the crossover with like fashion brand, True. with you know, high street brands. Um, and also what you said about, um, you know, 2021 China, like the audience now seeing these 400 works and seeing how, um, you know, the commodity or the commercialization was, you know, heavily like kind of highlighted in Warhol's career. I think that really resonated with, with a lot of Chinese audience nowadays. And also the 15 minutes fame idea is now like, we were surrounded by that every day with all the social media and everything. I think he, Warhol was really ahead of his time and he really saw a lot of these things coming. But, but are we having too commercialized? I think art and most other things are coming in a circle. Oh, you think so? Art. You're very philosophical. <laughs> you should transfer to the philosophy <laughs> department. Art started with portraits and drawings and then it developed into more abstract and complex and vague things with the movements like cubism and surrealism and this kind of stuff. Now it's going back to where it started. Where it's things that everyone can relate to. I luckily got to meet some of the best contemporary artists in China today and they draw very ab abstract things at the time but um, there wasn't really a tax on it in the first so there was this huge market boom um, with the auctions and the collectors but I think it's still focus mainly um, on the West. If you're an artist, your goal is to get signed by a Western gallery, not a Chinese one. Uh, there's other commercial elements in the, in the auction industry, of course. But what you said is very interesting, the choice that artists have to make when it comes to commercialization. Yeah, of course, totally. Um, I mean, in terms of commercialization, you know, there's a, in China, there's artists, they really open to working with a different brand, you know, doing all kinds of collaboration, but there are also, you know, artists they can only working with, you know, like, you know, famous galleries. 
And there are also, you know, some artists, they, they just don't want to sign to anyone. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, make their work them themselves. Yeah, I think one, maybe one of the most famous story will be, you know, the American painter Agnes Martin invite his gallery, you know, to pay his gallery, their owner come to her house and to destroy all her painting together. So <laughs> I think that attitude still remain, you know, in our society today. You know, the last question I want to ask, it really has, once again, going back to that photo, standing right in front of it, seeing Andy Warhol 1982 with the kind of interesting coloring uh, on the face in front of the gate of heavenly peace still brings a very different feeling to me. Um, so I, I'm really wondering, you know, um, now the world is getting more complicated, it seems, than 10 years ago. I was just thinking, standing in front of the photo, what, what was the hope that people saw of his time? And facing that photo, what is the hope that we can still hold on to of our time? We're in an age where different forms of art take place and people are getting to know more and more. Even a few hundred years back, someone in China would have known an artist in Germany. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I'm still very optimistic about um, the future. Warhol says, an artist is someone who creates things people don't need. But I think an artist is someone who creates things people need, but they don't know. People exactly need, mm -hmm. but yeah. they don't know, right? Yeah, nicely said. I think that's a great photo. I think because the photo is actually exemplified something called, well, cultural exchange. So we, I think that's... It's not a cliche. Exactly, it's not a cliche. Yeah. And also, we can see Andy Warhol actually visited China. Like even today, you know, we're living the, the age that we think we're more and more connected, but actually not. Mm -hmm. You know, to be able to have a real cultural exchange, you maybe you have to still go there and go see it with your own bare eyes. I want to piggyback uh, on, on Neil's statement of cultural exchange. I think seeing that photo makes us realize, especially knowing the um, historical time point, um, it's, before, it's after the uh, opening of, uh, reform and opening up, it's after the uh, star art movement, it's before 85 um, a new wave, we realize that like, you know, arts and culture exchange wouldn't be stopped be because of some, you know, outside forces, um, like pandemic, uh, given being in, in the pandemic, we still are able to see these works that travel all the way thousands of miles, and then put together by teams that are uh, working together over the internet and then these kind of things just make me really thankful and then realize that you know a lot of works I actually have seen in the Whitney um, in the Whitney version of the Andy Warhol show but it just makes me really miss this international traveling and then realizing that um, art is this something that kind of bring us all closer together right. thank you so much you guys are terrific <laughs> thank you really appreciate it an icon an unusual exhibition, and a story about understanding through art. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Insight, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.